let's get into Article 110, General Requirements for Electrical Installations. Um, any change in Article 110, just by its nature, is kind of a big deal. You, you can't screw up when you change Article 110, because anything that happens in Article 110 happens to the entire code, right? Everything has to, or, or, or Article 110 is the general requirements for, for everything. So, Article 110 has quite a few changes. Some of them I really like, some of them, well, let's get talking about them. Article 110, first thing is examination, identification, installation, use, and listing, also known as product certification. This is in section 110.3. Cybersecurity concerns are now addressed. Never thought we'd be talking about that in the NEC. Manufacturer's instructions for unlisted equipment must now be followed, and an informational note was added to help users find uh, product instructions. So let's take a peek. 110.3a. A lot of people jump into 110.3b because that's the rule that says you have to use listed products in accordance with the listing instructions. And 110.3b is, is a very important section. But a lot of people, they, they skip over 110.3a. And 110.3a has some valuable information as well. Now, <clears throat> this speaks mainly to the inspector, to the authority having jurisdiction. But this is something that the design professional needs to know and the installer needs to know as well. When determining approval of equipment, so that's the AHJ, when the AHJ is approving equipment, they must evaluate the following things. Item one, first thing you need to evaluate is suitability for installation and use in compliance with the requirements of the code. So does this stuff even comply? I mean, look at this stuff here. You know, non-UL liquid tight flexible steel conduit. <laughs> Great. Well, look, not everything has to be listed, and certainly nothing has to be listed specifically by UL. You know, UL is one certifying body, but so is Intertech and TUV and you know, there's CSA. There, there's several certifying bodies, um, but there are things in the code that do have to be listed. Luminaires, light fixtures, they have to be listed, right? New to the 2023, circuit breakers have to be listed. Liquid tight flexible metal conduit has to be listed. This stuff says right here, not listed. Okay, <laughs> where do you use that? Well, you look down here and it says, ah, oh, use this in applications where agency approvals are not required. Does that mean you can't have you, you can't fail inspection if you don't get a permit <laughs> is that what that's okay look you can't use this stuff right anywhere where the code is applicable now who could use this product well an original equipment manufacturer could use it right you know, if you're designing electrical equipment and building it and then you go and send it off to get tested and listed fine but you and i we can't use this stuff right so number one Suitability for installation and use in compliance with the requirements of the code. That's the first thing we have to figure out. Does this stuff even comply? There's two informational notes to item one. It says, look, equipment can be new, but it doesn't have to be. It can also be reconditioned, refurbished, or remanufactured. And uh, I think I'm going to make a proposal in 2026 to clarify that it can be used as well. We install used equipment all the time, right? I mean, once I, if I install a circuit breaker and then I take it out and move it, that's used, right? Can I install used equipment? Of course you can. Of course, right? It can't be damaged. You know, it has to work properly, but of course we can install used equipment. We can install new equipment. We can also install reconditioned, refurbished, or remanufactured equipment. Now, we're going to talk more about reconditioning than I ever would have wanted to, but it's not the subject for today's class. So, reconditioned, refurbished, manufactured, we'll talk about that stuff later, I promise. Informational note 2 says suitability can be determined by product descriptions, markings, instructions, listing and labeling, or similar, and instructions should also be consulted. Now, there's a rule in section 406.9b as in Bravo that says if you have uh, a receptacle, certain receptacles in wet locations, they might have to have a cover that's weatherproof while in use. So one of these guys, right, an in-use cover, a bubble cover, these are actually called an outlet box hood. In that section, it also says that outlet box hoods have to be listed, fine, and they have to be identified as extra duty. Now, extra duty, or excuse me, identified, means that it's recognized as being suitable for the application, specific use, environment, and so forth. So, how do I know this product is extra duty? 
<laughs> yeah, well, there you go, right? Because it says it. Okay, well, suitability can be determined by product descriptions, markings, right? So how do I know this is extra duty? Because the manufacturer says it is. There you go. We also need to evaluate things like mechanical strength and durability. Okay, so here's this uh, installation I saw. Oh boy, this must have been almost 20 years ago. Um, I was teaching a class and uh, walked outside and there's this tree and there's this conduit going up the tree and this big junction box here in the tree. And, you know, trees can support wiring methods and boxes, but, you know, conduits have to be supported. Support mechanisms do not have to be listed. Support hardware does not have to be listed. Conduits, tubings, cables, the wiring methods must be listed. The fittings must be listed. The support hardware does not. So they used a belt around the tree. <laughs> now, it's not listed, but it doesn't have to be. So here's where me as the AHJ, I have to use 110.3a and examine the suitability of the equipment. I have to look at what? compliance with the code. I have to look at wire bending space, electrical insulation, heating effects under normal and non-normal conditions. Number two, mechanical strength and durability. Maybe that's mechanically strong, but what about the durability? How long is this thing going to last out there in freeze-thaw cycles, direct rays of the sun? You get my point. So we have to analyze things like mechanical strength and durability. We have to look at arcing effects. We have to consider voltage, type, size, ampacity, specific use. So here I have uh, an explosion proof and dust ignition proof switch enclosure. Now that sounds like you could use that anywhere, right? It's explosion proof, you know, <laughs> that's the cream of the crop, right? Well, we have to look a little bit closer. This thing says that it's suitable in class one, group C and D, class two, groups E, F, and G, and class three. Okay, cool. Well, class 3 doesn't have any groups, so we're good there. Class 2 contains groups E, F, and G, so that's good. Class 1 contains groups A, B, C, and D. Now, this says it's good for groups C and D. So, what if you're installing this in an area that's hazardous due to the presence of acetylene or uh, hydrogen, right? Group A and group B. Can't use it. So, we need to evaluate specific use. So, really important that we understand the product's limitations. New to this version of the code, we added item 8, and this is an interesting one. Cybersecurity concerns for life safety equipment connected to a network, including malicious attacks and unauthorized changes, as well as the ability to continue to perform correctly and safely. Okay, uh, look, <laughs> it, new switch gear and new switchboards, modern, modern equipment, it, it does not look anything like the stuff that we installed 30 years ago or that my, my, my wife's grandfather installed 100 years ago, right? He was an electrician. He, uh, he gave me his benders in his will. I think I'll do a video on that one these days. So anyway, um, you can get switchgear and switchboards now that have a full-blown computer on them. I mean, you know, that, that's what we're looking at here. If you, if you can squint and look to the right, you can see the circuit breakers, right? I mean, that, that is a switchboard right there with a computer on it. If I can use my username and password and get in there and change the settings, that's one thing. If I can plug, physically plug my laptop into it and change the settings, that's another thing. If I can get on my phone and change the settings, uh, that's a whole different kettle of fish, right? If I can change this from a remote location with my username and password, I got news for you. So can a smart, bored teenager. And those are usually the ones that would take down a hospital, right? I mean, we talk about terrorist attacks and everything else, and obviously we need to be talking about those things. But seriously, who, who are the ones that are, that are the cyber criminals? Usually bored teenagers that are really, really smart and really bored and think that there's nothing funnier than knocking out the emergency system of a building or a substation or a hospital, right? So if we have life safety equipment connected to a network, we need to evaluate cybersecurity. Now, the NEC, rightfully, in my opinion, does not tell us how to do this. That's not within the scope of the code. And let's just be honest, that, that's not within the wheelhouse of the committee members. The guys on Code Making Panel 1 and, and all the Code Making Panels, we're electrical guys, right? We're, we're either we're, we're instructors like myself or authors or we're manufacturers or we're design professionals, we're installers, we're inspectors. We're not computer guys. 
right? And maybe if one or two of us are, that's not enough. So we're not going to tell you how to do a cybersecurity evaluation on your system. We're just simply going to say that you might have to do it if you have life safety equipment connected. We get into this in Article 708 for Critical Operations Power Systems. So take a look at Article 708 and you'll actually see some cybersecurity requirements back there. And then, of course, item 9, any other factors that could play a role in electrical safety. So, you know, here we've got this box. By the way, these things are permitted, uh, the, the way the box is supported. But we need to look at other factors, you know. Uh, is it subject to physical damage? The, the location, right? I mean, is, is this wiring method suitable for that installation? What about the corrosion uh, effects based on its height? You know, if we have freeze-thaw cycles and snow and melting and everything. So, item 9 other factors that could play a role in electrical safety. Now, if we keep reading, we get into 110.3b, and what this has historically said is equipment that's listed, or equipment that's listed or labeled or both, must be installed and used in accordance with any listing or manufacturer's instructions. All right, here is a listed product. This is not listed by UL, but it doesn't have to be. It's listed by Intertech, which is fine. So, this is listed, which means I need to follow the instructions. New to this version of the code, it says if it's listed or labeled or identified. Remember we talked about identified a minute ago and we said identified means that it's recognized as being suitable for a specific application, purpose, use, etc. So who's the person that judges whether it's suitable? Right? Who's the person who recognizes whether it's suitable? Well, that's the AHJ. It's not a testing laboratory necessarily. So this is saying, look, if the AHJ is saying this is identified for a particular application, then we need to follow the manufacturer's instructions. So we've always had to follow, we've, had, we've long had to follow the instructions for listed products. Now we're saying even if the product's not listed, if it's identified, if it's suitable for the application, we had to follow the manufacturer's instructions. Sometimes it can be kind of, uh, kind of surprising, so we do need to read the instructions. You know, now this one says something that's not particularly surprising. It says, look, use only square D breakers in this square D panel board. Hey, <laughs> totally understand. If I was square D, I would put that in my equipment as well. Um, if you can read this, this language up here, it actually talks about it. It, it, pl it places limitations on the ratings of the breakers based on where they are in relation to the main, to the, uh, to the main feeders coming in. So sometimes there is some, some surprising requirements. We need to make sure we're reading instructions. So this panel board says use only square D breakers. Right, there we go, circled right there. Oh, perfect, same panel board. On the left, you can see right here where it's a little bit bolder than the rest. It actually says 100 amp max circuit breaker can be installed in the lowest position. All other positions are limited to a 70 amp breaker. Yeah, rather surprising. The part that I wanted to talk about here, though, is where it says use only square D breakers, which, I, again, I understand. When they sent their panel board to UL or Intertech or whoever, they probably sent their panel board and a box full of their breakers, and they tested them, right? And they passed the test, and they got listed, and everything's good. And square D, of course, is going to say, I'm, I'm not speaking for square D, obviously, but they're going to say, listen, man, we didn't test anybody else's breakers in our panel. So we're going to say use only our breakers because we know that our breakers are going to be safe in this panel. We don't know if anybody else's breakers are going to be safe, so use ours. I get it. But what if a different company came along and said, hey, I think our breakers are pretty good. And I think they'd work just fine in a square D panel and I think they'd be safe. Could that other company send a square D panel and their own different breakers off to a testing lab and say, hey, test these and make sure they work. Testing lab's going to say, yeah, sure, we'll test them. And if it works and it's safe, then you might get what's called a classified item. So the breakers here on the right are a listed product. Not only that, they're also classified, which means they, they kind of act as an addendum to the listing of another product. So you can see where it says this is listed and it's classified. For Siemens, Murray, ITE, GE, Square D, Krauss, Heinz, Thomas & Betts. So yeah, you actually could put this breaker in that panel board. It is classified for that application. Now that's not new. That's that's been in the code. That's that's been the case for a long time. The only new thing here is we have to follow instructions for listed equipment and identified equipment. 
We also made an informational note saying, look, you know, the days of getting a massive stack of instructions when you buy equipment might be a thing of the past, you know, and, and you guys are probably well aware of it, right? You, you buy a, whatever we're talking about. You buy a new piece of equipment, whether it's electrical equipment or appliance or anything else. A lot of times it'll have like one page of instructions and the instructions will be, go to our website. <laughs> or the instructions will be one of these, right? A QR code, a quick response code. So they added an informational note here in this section to say, listen, instructions, they could be printed material, obviously. They could be found on the manufacturer's website, or they could be in the form of a quick response code or a QR code. So looking at this circuit breaker here, I could scan that with my phone, do what the thing says, right? Take me to the link, and there you go. QR codes are cool, right? I mean, what, a, what an amazing technology. So anyway, that's recognized now in this informational note.